My name is Camden Dunkerley, and I have 23 siblings. When I say that, some people are immediately confused, and a surprising majority insinuate that one of my parents slept around. This is not the case, though. I was conceived via artificial insemination with anonymous donor sperm. They went online to a cryobank and selected a donor, picking out of the baby picture lineup by who looked most like my dad. My mom was told that there would be a maximum of eight recipients of each donor sample and that there would be minimally 500 miles between each child. My dad just wanted to forget the procedure and raise me on his own, fearing I would resent him and view him as illegitimate. In this documentary, I share the story of what it is like to be one of 24 half-siblings. My half-brothers and sisters share the impact it has had on their lives, and so does our donor a man who had no idea he had fathered 24 children. Well, at least that we know of so far. They are coming out of the woodwork. When I was two years old, a segment of 60 Minutes aired featuring Wendy Kramer, the founder of the Donor Sibling Registry, which connects families who have used anonymous sperm. My mom had connected previously with two moms who used the same donor by signing up to the registry. They shared baby pictures and similarities between all the children. But all of that changed once the 60 Minutes episode aired. One of the other moms wrote, They are coming out of the woodwork, in an email to my mom. A Brief History of Sperm Donation Artificial insemination has had rapid growth in popularity since the 1970s, but unofficial reports state that King Henry IV of Castile, nicknamed the Impotent, made the first attempts to artificially inseminate a woman as early as 1450. The first official baby born via artificial insemination occurred in 1943. This was a well-practiced method by the turn of the 20th century, and according to a New York Post article from 1955, there has been 50,000 children born as a product of donor insemination, and that number has increased by 6,000 annually. Although this method has been practiced for decades, if not centuries, the topic is still considered taboo. In the early days of commercialized insemination, fertility experts advised both the donor and the recipients to never think of that day again. They should just go home and forget about their procedure, not even informing their closest friends and family. Part of the reason for this is that despite the ideal of separation between church and state, the U.S. is heavily influenced by its Puritan history and conservative values. The Bible contains very traditional views, including the opinion that the only proper way of conceiving a child is through a husband and wife. So what happens when the child is only biologically the mother's? Traditional views would consider a donor-conceived child illegitimate because they were conceived by someone other than the typical father. In the early days of commercialized sperm donation, only white heterosexual couples were allowed to purchase the sperm. This means that the children born from about 1970 to 1990 were likely never told about their origins because of the advice of medical professionals and the weight of society's views on the parents' shoulders. Shockingly, some fertility specialists have taken the patient's lack of knowledge and used it against them. For example, some doctors have utilized their own sperm when artificially inseminating a woman. Most notably, Dr. Donald Klein has, at last count, 50 biological children throughout the 70s and 80s. Klein would regularly inseminate women coming to his clinic for fertility treatments. 
Again, with the wave of online DNA companies, the now grown children discovered what had happened to all of their mothers. This group was shocked to find out that there was no law anywhere in the country forbidding a doctor from inseminating a woman with his own sperm and that not of the donors. In 2016, Indiana passed Senate Enrolled Act Number 174, which protects future women seeking fertility treatment. But remember, that donor recipients were advised to never speak of the procedure ever again. So what happened to these donor-conceived children? What became of them and did they ever find out? These children did grow up and became what is known as the lost generation. People who were naive of their parentage until well into adulthood. This is a stark comparison to the lives of donor-conceived people who have known their whole lives. I want to say I was probably like five when I kind of connected the dots. So I was like, how did I, how did I get here? Everybody else has a dad, and everybody else is kind of like, oh yeah, you need to, you need a dad to exist. And I'm like, okay, uh, how does that work? And so my mom was like, yeah, we used a donor. And I was like, I don't know what that means. She's like, I'll tell you later. <laughs> But uh, yeah, five. So it's been just me and my mom for my whole life. But ever since I can remember, she has told me where I came from and what she did to have me. And yeah, I've known that I've had half siblings and that I had a sperm donor my entire life. Um, but when I got into contact with everyone, it was April of 2020. And so that's when I started talking to everyone. So for as long as I can remember, I've always known about all of my half-siblings. At the time um, that I can earliest remember, there was about five or six that were in contact, but I fully joined the group um, in 2019, um, but I was aware of it my entire life. There wasn't a specific time when I first kind of learned or knew. Um, I think it's because, you know, when you have two moms, it's kind of just assumed like you kind of know if everyone else around you has a dad there's kind of something happening um my parents would talk to us about it um and it was sort of just kind of a part of our family kind of just for um most of my life just something that my parents would kind of talk about um but it definitely wasn't until much later that we really chose to pursue more of the sibling relationships but there was definitely not a specific age or a specific time that i learned that i had a, a donor parent was donor conceived why do men donate? What is the donor's motivation to donate? The foundation of this science is all based on the willingness of men to donate sperm. There have been numerous studies on what drives a man to donate, and it usually falls into three categories. Altruism, financial compensation, and the ability to verify one's own fertility. So why exactly did I choose to donate? Well, um... I think there were two reasons, really, um, and I think a lot of other donors would probably say something similar. Um, firstly, it was a chance to help other people, um, families, couples who couldn't conceive. Um, and if I could help, then great. Um, and the other thing was it was, to be totally honest, it was very well paid. So. Um, combination of helping others and getting paid to do it uh, why would you not a New York math professor by the name of Ari Nagel dubbed the sperminator by the media who as of May 2021 had fathered 78 children and had gotten an additional 13 women pregnant this number seems even more staggering because Nagal donates sperm in hotel rooms, Target bathrooms, and remarkably, even the American Museum of Natural History rather than at a cryobank. In order to donate so prolifically, Ari Nagal traveled in the midst of the pandemic, even going so far as to take his brother's passport in order to donate in Israel, a country that has barred him from donating. Okay, so the American Society of Reproductive Medicine recommends the number of live births be limited to 25 per population of 800,000. Do you agree with this figure? No, it's all smoke and mirrors, you know. So that means there's like, I don't know, hundreds of births allowed in, in New York City for any donor. So yeah, the whole thing, their recommendations 
-hmm. have absolutely no meaning. You can't set limits until you actually have accurate record keeping and know how many kids are born for any one donor. No sperm bank knows that. So all the limits that they give and they promise to donors and to parents, uh, they're all false because you can't promise limits until you have accurate records and they don't. Um, do you think that unknowing siblings accidentally crossing paths poses a threat to donor conceived people? Absolutely. And we know that random meetings happen all the time mm -hmm. from, you know, two kids playing on a little league team together, find out they're half siblings later on mm -hmm. on a Disney cruise at a park, uh, in school, at a party, in college. Uh, random meetings are not uncommon. They happen all the time. Uh, I know uh, in my sibling group, there was a set of twins that we've known about pretty much my entire life. And the male twin, he works at a pet store and a woman came in one day and started talking about how similar he was to her son and how she bet that they would be best friends. And the woman ended up giving Gavin, the sibling, her son's number. And it wasn't too much later that we discovered that the twins had lived their entire lives 15 minutes away from another sibling. And sure. we had no clue that that sibling had ever existed. Sure. No, stories like that happen all the time. Uh, there was a funny one I heard a couple of months ago about uh, a donor conceived young woman who was, uh, she's gay, she's on Tinder she's swiping and she swipes right on this girl mm -hmm. turns out to be her, her half sister yep yeah <laughs> um so in your experience are there any feasible ways to make sure donors are adhering to the promise of only donating at one clinic well they'd have to again have a, it all comes down to accurate record keeping right so there's got to be some kind of regulation some kind of oversight somebody who's mandating accurate record keeping. And that's where kind of everything starts. When you look at regulation and making things better and making this more ethical and responsible industry, we, we always come back to, to square one, which is the first thing they need to do is have accurate records mm -hmm. on the uh, each donor. You know, they should share these records with other sperm banks so that you know when a donor hops from sperm bank to sperm bank, which is very common. Um, and they need to just keep track of how many kids are born for any one donor, who they are, where they are, because then if there's a medical issue, an urgent medical issue that needs to get shared, then they would actually have a way to share and update that information with the families. Right now, they don't. They don't share and update medical information with families because in most cases, they don't know who the families are. And even, uh, you know, if it's like a fatal heart condition, mm -hmm. they still cannot get to the families so that those kids can get in for adequate screenings and preventative medicine mm -hmm. because they don't know who the kids are. So, you know, again, back to square one, accurate record keeping. The... Um, in the United States, the cattle industry does artificial insemination and the cattle industry demands that there's accurate records on all uh, calves that are produced. The myth of anonymity in sperm donation. Changed and learned and listened to our donor conceived kids. So we've been evolving for decades. The industry just, you know, because it's all about profit, Mm -hmm. Any kind of change that they implement from keeping accurate records to limiting the number of kids for any donor, for updating and sharing medical information, all of that costs money. So that's why they just don't want to change anything. They like it the way it is where they can maximize their profits. But at what cost? And we know the cost now to donor conceived people, you know, having 200 half siblings or a genetic issue that never should have happened mm -hmm. um, or, you know, just struggling, not knowing one half of their identity, their ancestry. Um, are, are there any systems in other countries that you feel the U.S. could easily adopt? 
The problem is that no matter what the local laws in other countries, so there are laws like in Australia and the UK and Canada about anonymity and uh, not paying donors and numbers of kids, but now all of those countries mainly import sperm from the US and, and Denmark, but it's the same situation. So the local laws are really meaningless when everyone's importing sperm from the US which is the Wild West with no laws, no regulation, anybody, you know, there's no limit mm -hmm. on the number of kids or no one's, there's no mandatory medical updates or sharing of medical information. Open donation is all smoke and mirrors. Uh, people, you know, grow up thinking, oh, when I'm 18, I'll get to know my biological father. And then they turn 18 and they're told, oh, we couldn't find him. Oh, he changed his mind. So there are no guarantees with any of it. Obviously, every family is different, but do you still believe that transparency is the best option regarding a child's conception? Absolutely, and it's not even an option anymore. So openness and honesty, it's, you have to do it because with DNA testing the last 16, 17 years, the non-disclosure is not an option anymore. If you don't tell your child, then you're, you're basically going to allow them to find out on their own, and that doesn't fare well for anybody. It was really just the honor system. So what kind of information did they give me uh, when I donated? So you have to remember this is over 20 years ago now, so... Um, I may not be able to remember everything, but I do remember they, um, there was a lot of paperwork, um, big fat forms to fill out, um, and a pretty detailed um, medical exam that they, they had me do. Um, big section on the form about medical, like family medical history. Um, but I remember thinking at the time that it was, it was pretty much just the honor system. You just had to tell them, um, check the boxes according to what you what you knew. I don't know if they ever checked uh, with anyone else in the fam within my family to, to establish whether what I put on that medical family history was, was true. Um, and other than that, they were very clear that they had no parental rights, uh, but also no parental obligations. So, um, my contribution was just to donate the sperm and that was that was the end of it so um have i given any thought or had i given any thought to children that might have been conceived uh before we discovered the group um to be totally honest no not not really um when alex and i had our daughters of our own that was the that was the family those are the kids and uh it makes me think that I might even have completely forgotten that I had donated um, because when Mia and I put our saliva into a ancestry DNA test tube a couple of years ago, um, it actually never occurred to me that it might make all these connections which have subsequently happened. So um, honest answer, I don't think I really gave it very much thought for about 18 years after. A couple of my half-sisters had started a group chat, and as we found more siblings, we invited them to join. So when I first reached out and spoke with a sibling was in the late summer of 2019, and I first talked to Justine, who that same day we made our Snapchat group chat with about 10 siblings, and that was the first time that I had ever spoken one-on-one -on -one with many of our siblings. So I joined the group chat as soon as it was created because I was one of the original siblings, which meant I was a part of the registry since birth, but um, I think there were about 10 of us when the group chat started, but now it's definitely doubled. So the day that I got added was the same day that Charlotte, Colin, Bryce, and Avery got added. So there was five of us in one day, and I remember thinking, what the heck, does this happen every day where you just meet like 
five new siblings. Um, but since then, like, it's just become normal. My mom will notice that I'm on my phone more and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, like, we just met a new sibling. Like, it's something that happens not all the time, but frequent enough where she's like, oh, yeah, like, that makes sense. Um, and it's nothing but positive for me because it's like, you've never heard of this person before, but you automatically have a connection with them and you know that you're going to take care of them and you can count on them. And it's just really nice to be a part <clears throat> of a big group. And I haven't been in the group chat since there's been like the small number but since I've joined there's been I want to say at least six new siblings found and it's just so cool every single time and I really enjoy meeting new people and talking to them. I've always loved it. I love getting to talk to new siblings for the first time and just getting to know them and in the back of your mind knowing like oh this stranger is like related to me it kind of makes the situation super unique and super fun and just breaks the ice a little bit so I've always enjoyed it um just because it, it's an excuse to like get to talk to someone new and get to know them on like a bit more of a personal level I think when I first joined kind of started talking to siblings there were probably about like 10 or so somewhere on there and so i was definitely in it when um more and more people more and more siblings kept showing up i think at first it was pretty overwhelming like i think it was kind of yeah it was a bit it definitely i think overwhelming is a good word there's something about it like knowing there's so many people out there who share your same genes that makes it feel a bit more and this is just my initial reaction i definitely don't feel this way now but there's kind of an element of it that makes you feel maybe a bit more like a number. That's kind of how I felt a little. But I think when you start building more of the connections and start getting to know people and talking to them, it just feels like a friendship. And it just is cool to have the group expand and just um, be able to talk and get to know even more people. And having connections all over the country is something that's really cool, especially as I'm kind of nearing college age, just having people that you know and people who you can spend time with and talk to and are genetically related to you kind of everywhere. It's It feels nice to know kind of anywhere you go in the country, there will be somewhere nearby who you could count on or talk to or spend time with. 5370, International Man of Mystery. I was aware that I was donor conceived from age nine. From that point on, I knew that my donor was out there somewhere. But I was always trying to rationalize that I would probably never get to meet the man responsible for my being here. This was the general consensus among the siblings. One day, however, my best friend Kylie and I were determined to try and track down this man of great mystery. I'd looked over the informational packet and listened to the interview, but that was really only to see what his handwriting looked like and what his voice sounded like. I had never sat down and listened, so we did. Within the first minute and a half, our donor said that he was into international sales in the food and beverage industry, dealing specifically with New England and mid-Atlantic states. I will never forget sitting on my porch and looking at Kylie as she uttered, I found your dad. She handed my phone back and I gazed down at the thousands of pixels that made up the first real picture I had ever seen of my donor. I told the Sibs group what we had found out and we decided to reach out to Tim. Kind enough to reply, Tim told us that he was in fact donor 5370 and that he was married with two daughters of his own. In the email, Tim said that he would be talking to his daughter's and if the reaction was positive, he'd put them in contact with us. So I thought it was super wild when we found Tim. I had always understood through the process that it was just kind of a fact of life that I probably was never going to know who my biological father was, and I was really content in that. Um, so when we were able to find Tim and then subsequently Mia and Zoe, it was just absolutely wild because something that was never part of my reality suddenly was and it's been super great to get to so know him. i was probably 12 or 13 years old when we found tim and at that point i had already pretty much accepted that i probably wasn't ever going to find out who my dad was and then we found tim and two more siblings read it to the group chat and the only thing that i kept like thinking about was like we know what his name is now we know what he looks like now and we know like how all of the siblings got our features. And it was just 
a mind-blowing experience, honestly. I will say that when we first found out about Tim, I think it was just pretty, like, it just felt pretty chaotic. It was really crazy when it happened. I just think, you know, for so long it was, you know, he was an anonymous donor. And so I, it was crazy to see that he was, like, a person with uh, kids and a house and a wife and, like, all these things. Um, but I think it was, it was cool. And, yeah, we were able to find two more siblings from it. So that was a great thing. Um, it felt pretty novel at first, but I think the more time that passed, the more it just felt like he's a guy. I don't know. Like it just, it, I think there was a big kind of crazy thing at first, but the more time that passed, the more it felt just, um, he's just another person and it's another relationship that you can have. I personally don't think of him as my dad. I think of him, you know, genetically as my biological father, but in almost another sense, I think of him as like, some of my siblings dad in that sense like me and zoe's dad i don't think of him as my dad personally i think it's cool to have more siblings but i just think for me the connection is more based on um the siblings rather than um tim so i was not there the day that they actually found him because i hadn't been added to the group chat at that point so that day when cam's mom messaged my mom she also said hey they found the guy and that was scarier to me than actually talking to my siblings because it was a huge, obviously your parents are a huge chunk of your life and it was that missing piece that was going to like be known to me. And so I remember seeing his picture, finding his name, finding out that he lived in Massachusetts where I live for his entire, most of his life, um, was really like insane to me. And I think the craziest thing was that seeing how much I looked like him because it's been one thing in my family that I look so much like my mom but seeing a picture of Tim it was like no I actually look a lot like him um and since then I've met him and he is the like the nicest person ever and Alex is the nicest person ever and I just think that it really he couldn't be a better person not to be like too weird or anything but he's so nice and I was really glad that it was him so what was my reaction when I first got um, an email from Norvi. So I actually, I've heard from a few people that Norvi emailed me. I've never, I never received that email. So, um, but I did get a letter in February of 2020 from Norvi's mother, Lee, uh, introducing themselves, introducing the group um, and introducing herself. Um, I think my reaction was just surprise sort of naturally, um, that um, there was uh, there were as many different families uh, as there were who were involved, um, and as many children as there were. I don't think the cryobank had ever given me any indication of how many times my donations would be used, uh, or to how many different families. So I had no real idea what to it expect so um but there, there was there was a lot of kids uh and that was a surprise for sure but as i've got to know some of them um it's um it it wasn't a bad surprise it's really only been a only been a good um inter only been good interactions really um but i can't deny it was a it was a surprise when i first opened the letter um the letter included pictures of, of Norvi aged, I think, 15 or 16, who looked very much like I did when I was that age. Um, and pictures of Quincy aged 11 or 12, who looked very much like my daughter Zoe at the same age. So um, I saw the pictures before I saw the letter and I knew what was in the letter. So, uh, how did Alex feel about um, me donating either at the time or, or more recently? So, um, at the time, I don't think she really thought very much of it at all. Um, it was not, we, she and I talked about it before and it wasn't, um, she didn't seem unhappy about me doing it at all. Um, more recently, um, I think she's actually quite enjoyed meeting some of the the kids that she's met and some of the parents as well. Um, quite interested to see, as I mentioned before, the physical resemblance that I have with some of them more than others. Um, but both she and I come from 
families which are pretty complicated in terms of half brothers and stepsisters and second marriages and things like that so this is just another crazy addition to the uh crazy family trees that we both already have just take a deep breath it's not like all these kids are going to call you tonight you know everybody's very at least on the donor sibling registry parents donors donor conceived people everyone's very well aware of the situation and they don't want to overwhelm or disrupt anyone's life so people are very respectful when it comes to uh, their communication and um, how frequently they communicate They're, you know, especially with the donor, they, they always want the donor to know the balls in your court, you set the boundaries, mm -hmm. we will abide by them. And uh, donors are also very respectful to the families saying, I would love the opportunity, you know, not sure how this is going to go or where we go from here. Uh, but I'm game, you know, to explore and see what kind of relationship might be possible. Still, a need for regulation. We consider ourselves incredibly lucky with how accepting and open-minded Tim was about us reaching out. All of our moms had signed a contract saying that they wouldn't seek out any information about the donor until we, the donor-conceived children, turned 18 and then we could reach out to the cryobank for additional information. Once again, with the rise of online DNA tests, it would be entirely possible to accidentally find your donor. I would say we have been fortunate enough where, for the most part, everything has been relatively positive, considering there are so many of us. But for other individuals in our similar situation, that is not always the case. If there's no max capacity, things just have the potential to get really out of hand. And they claimed there was a 10 family limit, but obviously that was not the case. So I think there should just be a bit more control over everything. Um, either actually staying at that 10 family limit or being truthful and saying that there are more than 10 or just kind of reassessing the whole capacity limit in general like i think something something in the mix should be changed yeah i definitely think there should be limits especially considering how close gavin and devin were for so long it that's that's not right it should definitely have limits. i definitely think there should be some kind of regulation when it comes to stuff like this because based off of everyone's ages, Tim didn't donate for very long. And there were still 24 or even more siblings that came from his sperm. And um, with siblings living as close as 15 minutes away from each other, issues could have arose. So, Yeah, yeah, I think there really should be. Um, I completely agree with what Mia was saying. Um, I think it is we're fortunate enough in our situation to have a group of so many people and so many families connected where everyone gets along so well but i'm also very aware that that is not the case for many places and many people so i think that some kind of limit is good because i mean yeah i just it just seems smart it seems kind of like common sense to a certain extent um but i i think the more complicated bit comes in how you would control that because if controlling it or counting the numbers of families that have had kids, um, if that comes from the parents reporting it, it seems like such a flawed system because they're a new family with a new young kid. Like, I don't think their priority would be to report the report the successful pregnancy, but even still, I don't know exactly how else they would get that data. So I do agree that there should be limits, although I, um, I know it's really complicated and I'm aware there's not an easy way to control that or have a foolproof system where that is controlled. So I definitely think there should be some kind of limit, although I'm not really sure what that would be. Um, I think there definitely should be something just from a personal standpoint, like right now there's 24 of us and I have some really great friendships and really great connections with all of my siblings, but say I had been added to a group with 50 plus 60, there's no way you're going to be close to all of those people. I mean, in some way, maybe, but 
like the way that there's a small number of us you would never have the same relationships you would have with that many people and just in the instance that someone is not okay with it getting added to a group with that many siblings it's going to make it so much harder to handle than being a part of a group that has 25 or less or you know you know what I'm saying like I just think it would be smarter for the people that are not okay with it and it would make it easier for them to handle rather than being added to a group with tons and tons of siblings. The best part for me about this whole experience has been being able to discover more of myself through all of my half siblings. Um, as I grew up as an only child, I never really had that juxtaposition with another sibling around me, but because of that, it's been so fun when meeting all of my siblings to talk about our interests and even just something as basic as our mannerisms and see how scary similar they are, which obviously makes sense, but it's still been wild for me to see that in other people. Um, but additionally, it's just been wonderful knowing that I have people that I can count up, count on all over the country and I know especially for my mom and myself, it has been a big comforting fact since I moved from Connecticut to Texas for college that I have so many siblings so close by if I ever need anything and they've already helped me out for a me lot. personally, the best thing that has come out of the whole situation with the siblings is definitely the relationships I've gained from it, whether it's just hanging out with one of them in the city for the afternoon or flying across the country to see one of them. You know, we've done it all and the group it's kind of like a built-in friend group, which is so amazing to have. And overall, the siblings, they're all just awesome people with super fun personalities. And we were all just kind of thrown together. And, you know, we happen to have this one thing in common. And I just think that's super cool. Having all of these siblings is that I can go to the girls for advice or I can go to the guys for a good time. <laughs> Um, we definitely have some interesting conversations in that group chat, but um, it's like just having a one big group of friends because we don't live together. We don't like bicker and disagree like most siblings do, but um, yeah, it's been great so far. So I would say that there's two particular things that are really great about the situation. And the first is that not having two parents has made me really close with my mom and I can tell my mom anything and I tell her everything. Um, and not that that would be any different if I had two parents, but it's kind of made us really, really close. And I know a lot of my friends don't have that relationship with their parents. Um, so that's the first thing is that me and my mom are really close. And second is just getting to talk to all my siblings. It's like having an extended friend group across the country that you can go to for anything. You can ask for help and they will always help you. I know like a couple times people have FaceTimed me for math problems that I don't know how to how to handle and it's just so nice to talk to people with different perspectives and people with different experiences but you all have one tie-in connection and that connection is really strong. Um, but yeah, it's like having friends that you can always count on and it's really nice. Definitely the relationships are the best part of all of it. I mean, there's no contest. It's just getting to meet so many new people and building new connections and genuine friendships on top of this kind of, you know, genetic relationship. It's just taught me also that, you know, genetics are one thing, but it just is, it's really the connection that you have with people that really, um, you know, is just so strong. And I think it's just, so crazy how we're all just brought together by this one thing and we all you know get along and just the random conversations that we have and all the just getting to meet new people and travel new places and just kind of knowing like if i were to need help with anything in my personal social academic whatever any any part of my life there would be if i needed help someone could offer it and just knowing that there are so many genuinely good people out there who are rooting for you uh, the hardest parts and the best parts of this process um, the best parts have really been um, meeting the kids, some of the kids I've met, um, and uh, meeting some of the parents as well has been great, and hearing their, hearing their stories. Um, it's been uh, interesting, as any parent would say, it's been interesting to meet other people who have a physical resemblance to you and 
from the kids that I've met so far, some definitely have a much closer physical resemblance to me than some others I've met. Um, but there's really been no bad side. There's really been no downside uh, so far. The, of all the connections I've met with the, with the kids and the, and the parents, um, it's all been good. It's all been positive. It's either Absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, we always like to hear, especially from donor conceived people, like your take on it, your perspective, what are your challenges? What, what have been the good parts, what have been the difficult parts. Like, it's really important for people, uh, for parents, I think, and donors to um, educate them on you guys. You know? As we've seen, this is an incredibly complex issue. Not often do you find a topic that extends so deeply into legal implications, moral codes, and social acceptance. While the topic of anonymous gamete donation, and more specifically, anonymous sperm donation, will most likely remain taboo for quite a while, an increase in visibility and candor would make the public become much more receptive and open-minded. Above all in this industry, the most important quality by far is honesty and transparency. I am intensely proud of my origins, and wouldn't trade my support group 23 strong for anything. The end. For now. Cause it's a brand new day. The sun is shining. It's a brand new day. And for the first time in such a The best part for last Most stories have a hero who finds You make your past your past Yeah, you, you make your past your past It's a brand new day The sun is shining It's a brand new